Hey everybody, welcome to the Mana Leak. I'm John, as always, and it's that time again. We're a week away from pre-release, which means it's time to start the set review for Ixalan. We've got ourselves some merfolk, some pirates, some dinosaurs, and some vampires. Up first, we have three very quick disclaimers for this set review. Number one, first and foremost, this is a limited set review. I'm going to be talking primarily about draft, and of course, sealed will be very applicable to most of that knowledge, and I will talk about it as well, because of course, sealed is the pre-release this weekend. I am not talking about standard or legacy or commander or Canadian Highlander or anything like that. If I say that a card is terrible and unplayable, it doesn't mean that it's actually going to be the best card in your commander deck. It just means it's unplayable in limited in draft and or sealed. So keep that in mind. Disclaimer number two, these are my first impressions. I have not played with these cards. I've not tested this format out. The spoiler just came out today. So these are my uh, first impressions, my first approach to the format. These are how I'm going to be drafting these cards at my very first FNM with this set. These are how I'm going to be picking and playing these cards at my pre-release sealed event. These are my first impressions. They will and do change over time, but this is what I think of these cards going into the first weekend. Disclaimer number three, these of course are my opinions. I don't do set reviews to tell you what the correct rating is. I do set reviews to encourage discussion, discussion with me, discussion amongst yourselves. I want to hear your approach to these cards. If you think that I'm wrong about a rating, let me know. Talk with it with me. Talk with it with other people. This is to encourage thought and discussion in the community. I am not telling you that I am speaking the gospel truth of these cards. With that out of the way, let's move on into the first card. Up first, we have Adanto Vanguard. Adanto Vanguard is one and a white for a creature, Vampire Soldier at Uncommon. It's a 1-1. One, one. As long as Adanto Vanguard is attacking, it gets plus 2, plus 0. Pay 4 life, Adanto Vanguard gains Indestructible until end of turn. Now, this is interesting. It attacks as a 3-1 for 1 and a white, which I love. I love 3-1s for 1 and a white, but... The thing that I like about three ones are that they block and trade above their rate eventually when they stop being able to just r reliably attack in. This doesn't. In exchange, we get to trade a fifth of our starting life total to keep it alive by making it indestructible to on a turn. That's a lot. But the vampire tribe does have a good deal of life gain in their wheelhouse, so you might have extra kicking around. I'll have to watch this one, but I'm going to start a little bit down on it unless you're basically 100% certain that you're going to be the beat down always. Even there, I wouldn't go much higher than a C plus on this. To start with, though, I think I'm going to go all the way down to a C minus. I would cut this in many of my decks. Up next is Ashes of the Abhorrent. Ashes of the Abhorrent is one and a white for an enchantment at rare. Players can't cast spells from graveyards or activate abilities of cards in graveyards. Whenever a creature dies, you gain one life. This is our first F of the set. It is really not applicable for limited. It's obviously meant for constructed. It screws up with embalm and eternalize and flashback and all of the good stuff in legacy and modern and etc. I can definitely see it having homes in various formats, but in limited, it just doesn't do anything. It'll gain you a few life for the cost of two mana and far more importantly, a card in your deck. You should basically never, ever play this card. Stone Solid F. Up next is Axis of Mortality, our first Mythic. Four white white for an enchantment at Mythic. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may have two target players exchange life totals. Our second F of the set. Uh, utterly unplayable. It's a six mana enchantment that does nothing until the next turn. And even then, it may just do nothing if you have more life than your opponent does. You're going to hear stories of people reversing games where they were at one life and their opponent was at 20 and they played this card and then somehow survived a turn because you have to survive the turn and then they won that game. But the vast majority of the time, this is just going to be terrible. Please don't play this card. Stone Solid F again. Trust me, the cards get way better. 
Speaking of potentially better, Bellowing Aegisaur is up next. It's five and a white for a creature dinosaur at Uncommon. It's a three five and it has Enrage, which is the dinosaur mechanic for the set. Enrage is uh, not actually a mechanic. It's just a reminder text. It basically means that this creature will do something whenever it takes damage. So in this case, in Rage, whenever Bellowing Aegisaur is dealt damage, put a plus one, plus one counter on each other creature you control. A couple of quick notes about in Rage. It is not combat damage, it is damage of any kind. If it gets hit with a lightning strike or a lightning bolt, if, uh, if you deal damage to it yourself somehow, which is possible in this set, then the Enrage trigger will trigger. Now, Obviously, the nightmares of Ridge Scale Tusker are immediately starting, but this seems a lot less problematic. It's a 3-5 to start off. It's not a 5-5 like Ridge Scale Tusker was. That, that's much worse. It's a 6-mana creature. That's worse than the 5-mana that Ridge Scale was. It requires your opponents to be willing to attack into or block this, generally, in order to counter up your team. But it can happen multiple times, unlike Ridge Scale Tusker. I think this card will still be very solid and it needs to be respected, but I don't think it's going to be the game breaking mistake of a card that Ridge Scale Tusker was. That six mana is really going to be the weather vane of this format, though. If it's a slower, which boy do I ever need this set to be slower format, then six mana won't be horrible, but that's still usually getting towards the top of your curve, you don't want to have too many six drops, it, it still won't be easy even in the slowest of formats. If the format's fast, this thing doesn't stand a chance at all. That being said, from what I've seen, I just don't see this format being a super fast format as we have seen in the you know past calendar year. As is, I'm going to start this at a B minus. I'm thanking my lucky stars that it is not Ridge Scale Tusker. It definitely could be a bit better, and if people abuse this thing, it's going to feel real bad. But I'm going to start at a B minus. I would first pick it uh, after removal and bombs and stuff like that, and uh, I'm going to keep a close eye on it, see if it becomes the grown task that Ridge Scale was or not. Bishop of Rebirth is up next. Bishop of Rebirth is three white white for a creature vampire cleric at rare. It's a three four with vigilance. Whenever Bishop of Rebirth attacks, you may return target creature card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, yeah, this is just fantastic. It's a three four for five, which, you know, it's not the best, best rate we've seen, but it's begrudgingly playable. It's got Vigilance, which I often talk about is not something I want to pay for, but it is something that is nice to have. Uh, you know, for me, it's worth like half a mana. It's not even worth a full mana. So 3-4 Vigilance, cool, whatever. But the Sun Titan ability, whenever this thing attacks, you get to take a creature card from your graveyard back to play, getting the ETB triggers, etc. That is huge. I'm not going to go any higher than an A-, minus because it's not a guarantee that you'll be able to attack in with this every time. It doesn't have the ETB effect like Sun Titan does. Still, uh, having that slightly bigger butt should make it fairly reliable that you can attack in, and the effect is super powerful. Pretty big fan of this card. I'll easily first pick it. I'm going to keep it at an A-, minus, but that, that doesn't mean it's bad by any shape or form. It's a great card. A-. minus. Up next is a card that is obnoxious to say, and I have tried to record this a dozen times now. Bishops? Soldier is one and a white for a creature vampire soldier at common. It's a 2-2 two -two with lifelink. Apparently the days of bears, of two mana bears, is far behind us. This is just so much better than your average bear. Being a lifelinker plus a very relevant creature type in this format, all for two mana. Uh, you know, that being said, it still makes this kind of the floor of solid playables since... We don't just get two twos for two anymore, or they're in, you know, black or red or something like that. Uh, we get two twos for two with just ridiculous other abilities on them. It's a C plus by definition. It's a card that you'll play whenever you have it, but you won't go out of your way to get it too, too early. C plus for Bishop's Soldier. Bright Reprisal is up next. Bright Reprisal is four and a white for an instant on common. Destroy target attacking creature, draw a card. Uh, destroy target attacking creature is a little bit narrow, but usually playable. However, it usually costs maybe two or three mana. Five is a lot to ask for, but it does replace itself, which is nice. Ultimately, this is a bottom tier removal spell that you'll pick up mid to late mid pack or even later sometimes, and even not always play. 
If you're being aggressive, this is probably just too much mana, and even in a defensive deck, you'd prefer to not be spending an entire turn's worth of mana on this. So I have this at a C. You'll play it if you really have a spot or your deck is super friendly to it, but this is bottom tier removal. Demystify is up next. A single white mana for an instant. Destroy target enchantment. We've seen this card before. It's a perfect sideboard card. It absolutely never ever goes in your main deck though. It's as cheap as it can possibly get. There, there's no half mana outside of unhinged and you'll be happy to have it if you come up against a troublesome enchantment. Solid D. Duskborn Sky Marcher is up next. Duskborn Sky Marcher is a single white mana for a creature vampire cleric at uncommon. It's a 1 1 with flying, and you can pay white and tap it to give target attacking vampire plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. If you've got a fairly solid and very vampire filled vampire deck, this can be okay and it can get in for a few points of early damage, which is cool. It gets massively worse with fewer vampires though. I would say pick this up once you're already going down that path and absolutely not beforehand. 1-1 one, one flyers for one just aren't really that good on their own. You need this to be buffing other vampires regularly for it to even be okay. Rough guess, I'd say you're looking at having at least six or seven vampires at a bare minimum before you play this card. Uh, I'm going to put it at like a C, maybe a C plus if you're in the vampires deck, but uh, don't play this just because it's a 1-1 one, one flyer. Emissary of Sunrise is up next. Emissary of Sunrise is two and a white for a creature human cleric at Uncommon. It's a 2-1 with first strike, and when Emissary of Sunrise enters the battlefield, it explores. Explorer is a new mechanic with Ixalan, and Explore says reveal the top card of your library. It's not a May, you, you flip the card and you show off what it is. Put that card into your hand if it's a land. Otherwise, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature, then put the card back, or put it into your graveyard. So whenever a creature explores, that creature is either going to get a counter, and you get a sort of a scry. You can scry to the top or throw the card away. So it doesn't go to the bottom of the library, but that's basically the graveyard usually anyways. Now you are revealing that card, so you're not going to put the card back on top of your library that's the super secret surprise card that you need to catch your opponent by surprise with, because they're going to know what it is, but that's not often, often going to be that big of a deal. Or if that all of that doesn't happen, you're drawing yourself a land. You, you're getting a land if maybe you need it. You're getting it off the top of your deck, which is fantastic. So hopefully there's something not a land there usually. It, it just, it, it's just a great mechanic. So what we're looking here is a 2-1 first strike for three, which is already fine. I, I would already play that card. Obviously, I'd prefer to play pay two for it, but three is also totally fine. Getting that land draw or the pseudo scry plus making this into a three two, three two first striker for three i am all in this feels very first pickable in a weak pack and a card that you'll play every single copy of it basically the second that removal and bombs disappear from the pack this is going to be top of the picks easy b minus in my books it's it's missing that b grade just because it is an early to mid game card it's not going to do nearly as much later on in the game but B minus, I'm going to play as many of these as I can get my hands on. Up next is Encampment Keeper. Encampment Keeper is a single white mana for a creature hound at common. It's got first strike and it's a 1-1 one, one, and you can pay 7 and a white and tap it and sack it to give creatures you control plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. A 1-1 one, one first strike for 1 isn't really something that I'm ever in the market for. They're just never any good. It's just not impactful enough. Very late in the game, getting to pay 8 mana to overcome without the trample. Uh, my team is nice and might end some games, but your opponent sees it coming a mile away, unless you pay, I, I guess, 9 mana for it. But no, you have to tap it, so you can't even use it the turn that you play it. Uh, I'll see how it plays, but I'm going to start pretty out on this. It's just too unimpactful early. It's way too telegraphed and potentially just not enough in the late game. I'm going to start cutting it always at a C-. Glorifier of Dusk is up next. Glorifier of Dusk is three white white for a creature vampire soldier at Uncommon. She's a 4-4 and you can pay two life to give her flying until end of turn or, and if you want to, pay two life to give her vigilance until end of turn. 
A 4 4 for 5 is overcosted, no doubt, but paying 2 life to send her to the skies is well worth it in my mind, especially since the vampire tribe, as we'll see, is all about gaining life to pay it in other ways. All in all, just a solid card, maybe around like a B minus level. I'll always play it, and I'll pick it kind of at the top of the mid pack. Up next is Goring Ceratops. Goring Ceratops is 5 white white for a creature dinosaur at rare. It's a 3-3 with double strike. And whenever Goring Ceratops attacks, other creatures you control gain double strike until end of turn. Oh boy, that's a, that's a lot. Though you are paying a lot for it. Granting double strike to a team is an effect that is often extremely overcosted with very good reason. Uh, it would be format warping if this was like a five drop. Seven is definitely asking an extremely large amount of you, and so I'm going to bet that this will fall by the wayside sometimes. Certainly powerful, but I'm going to start this at a low B minus because of that cost. Even in the slowest of format, seven is not a mana amount that you just casually get to. You don't just assume you're going to get to seven mana. Be careful with this. That being said, this is a format that does look like you can probably build towards it. There's some toughnesses in this deck. There's some decent removal. Uh, there, there's not the outright aggression that we've been seeing over the past year. So I don't think that seven is unspeakable like it was in Amonkhet, for example. But be careful. Build around it. That being said, once you get there, and if you can attack, this thing is going to just be crazy. So uh, I'm going to keep it at a B minus just because of the cost. But uh, once it's down, it's going to play a lot more like an A minus or A. Imperial Aerosaur is up next. Imperial Aerosaur is three and a white for a creature dinosaur on common. It's a 3-3 three, three flyer. And when Imperial Aerosaur enters the battlefield, another target creature you control gets plus one, plus one and gains flying until end of turn. This is pretty similar to Battlefield Eagle from M15, which took me forever to remember what it was actually called, but it was a 2-2 and it gave plus 2 plus 2, but it cost a whopping 5 mana to do so. A 4 mana 3-3 three, three flyer is already fine, you'll already generally play that at like the C kind of level, but the boost of giving another creature flying for a turn and plus 1 plus 1 is going to really help keep the aggression on, or maybe even just end the game if you give it to a huge creature. And there are big creatures in this set. This seems totally fine and a relatively high mid-pack pick. Easy B- minus in my mind. I'll play every single copy I have of this and be quite happy with it. Up next is Imperial Lancer. Imperial Lancer is a single white mana for a creature human knighted on common. It's a 1-1. One, one. Imperial Lancer has double strike as long as you control a dinosaur. I'm not really a fan of this. It's a 1-1 one, one for 1 that will hopefully will much later in the game have double strike. So you're going to have it. 2-2 two, two in the real late game when you finally get one of these 6-drop, 7-drop dinosaurs. Uh, there's no reason to put this card in your deck. It's just way, way, way too unimpactful. one ones for one just are not playable. F. Bad card. Even if this naturally had double strike, I still don't think I'd play it. Inspiring Cleric is up next. Inspiring Cleric is a two and a white creature vampire cleric and on common to three two. And when Inspiring Cleric enters the battlefield, you gain four life. This is just completely playable. It's a three two for three vanilla, which is already begrudgingly playable, though you'll cut it if you can. Gaining four life, being a relevant creature type, and being in a tribe that wants that life to spend on other things all around seems fine. Not a high pick, very middle of the pack, I think, but generally just totally fine c plus i'll probably just always play this up next is ixalan's binding ixalan's binding is three and a white for an enchantment at uncommon when ixalan's binding enters the battlefield exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until ixalan's binding leaves the battlefield oblivion ring or, or the fixed version of him oblivion ring also your opponents can't cast spells with the same name as the exiled card. It's an O-ring that costs one more, which is still completely playable and highly pickable in the first pick range. The second ability is generally gonna be flavor text. The cards that opponents might have multiples in limited, uh, limited just aren't really gonna be the common targets of this card. Still, even without anything extra, this is just a solid A for me. Great removal is great removal. Easy first pick, solid A. Kinjali's Collar is up next. Kinjali's Collar is a single white mana for a creature human cleric at common. She's an 0-3, and dinosaur spells you cast cost one less 
to cast. I'm going to need a truly ludicrous number of dinosaur cards before I play this. O3 is pretty weak to be playing this as a way to get to the late game, but it will help for the first few turns at least. Ultimately, this is 100% deck dependent and probably doesn't become playable until you're hitting six or seven dinos in your deck. Unfortunately, a lot of the dinos are really expensive, so I don't know if you want to be playing six or seven six drops or seven drops. There are some cheaper ones, as we'll see for sure later this week, but I don't know. That being said, stacking these or, or stacking them with another dinosaur cost reducer that we'll see a little bit later this week could be cute, though probably doesn't up the grade too much. I'm going to keep this at a D- minus until I see that the make dinos cheaper dot deck is actually a thing. For now, D- minus. Not really going to play it. Kinjali's Sunwing is up next. Kinjali's Sunwing is 2 and a white for a creature dinosaur at rare. It's a 2-3 flyer. Creatures your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. Uh, totally fine. It's not a bomb. You know, it's not something that just instantly wins the game. But it's a card that's going to generate a huge amount of value, kind of like Imposing Sovereign does. Likely slightly shy of a first pick against really premium removal. I, I would take Ixalan's Binding over Kinjali Sunwing, but it's still real, real good. Solid B for me. Looks solid, and uh, it's going to be real annoying to play against, that's for sure. Legion Conquistador is up next. Legion Conquistador is 2 and a white for a creature vampire soldier at common. It's a 2-2. Two -two. When Legion Conquistador enters the battlefield, you may search your library for any number of cards named Legion Conquistador, reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle your library. This, of course, is very similar to our good old friend Squadron Hawk. Realistically, you're just not going to get too far with these guys, and all you're getting off them are overcosted bears. Taking flying off of Squadron Hawk is a pretty bad deal. At least Squadron Hawks flew. Basically, if you have one of these, they're unplayable. Two makes them still really cuttable in my mind. And maybe if you get three or more, they get a little bit higher. But I just don't see a vanilla 2-2 two -two doing enough in this format. So I'm going to put these guys at C-. I'm not really going to pick them. I'm not going to play them. I'm going to cut them reliably. And yeah, I'll, I'll keep an eye on them. But they're a far cry from Squadron Hawk. Legion's Landing is up next. Legion's Landing is a single white mana for a legendary enchantment at rare. When Legion's Landing enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 white vampire creature token with lifelink. So this is a 1-1 with lifelink for one. But that's not all. When you attack with three or more creatures, transform Legion's Landing. Transform is back. We've got double-faced cards. And in this set, they're all permanents, either artifacts or enchantments, that become lands. In this case, Legion's Landing becomes Adanto, the first fort, which is a legendary land that you can tap for a white mana, or you can pay two white to tap it to make another 1-1 white vampire creature token with lifelink. Getting a 1-1 lifelink vampire for one is not really good enough generally. Sacred Cat was an exception, and that was entirely due to Embalm, but if at some point I get to attack with three creatures, Adanto does seem really good. And as I'll mention a million times over over the next week, it's a mana sink that I think suggests this, this is going to be a set that I'm going to thoroughly enjoy. Sets with cards that have ways, ways for you to spend mana, even if it's a lot of mana for the effect that you're getting, makes flooding far, far less of a problem and makes for better games of magic. We haven't had one, or we haven't had many for quite some time. Getting a 1-1 lifelinker to chump block is well worth the three mana, and if attacks aren't happening, just establishing your board presence is that much better. Now, if you're attacking with three creatures, I feel like you're winning already. And so I'm not sure that the enchantment that the land is that much better. That much better than just playing a real creature as opposed to a 1-1 lifelinker. What it does do is it helps you be aggressive if you get this turn one, and then if things turn on you, it helps you defend if it's been flipped, which is actually really flavorfully accurate. They landed, they conquered, and now they're trying to defend what they've conquered. Ultimately, I'm going to have to play with this, but I feel like it's going to do too little in some games, and in others, it'll just be overkill. And in all cases, a better creature would have just been a better choice. Still, the power is there on a Danto. The mana sink is there on a Danto. So I'm not going to go any lower than a C plus on it. And I could easily seeing it, see it being a fair bit higher. But I'm going to have to keep a very close eye on this. So let's start it. 
at a C plus. Legion's Judgment is up next. Legion's Judgment is two and a white for a sorcery at common. Destroy target creature with power four or greater. This hits some pretty th serious threats for sure, and being only three mana is nice. Sorcery speed hurts it a little bit, and it's definitely well below premium removal. Still, I foresee never not playing this in sealed, and in draft only cutting it if I'm just flush with better choices. Not a super high pick regardless, kind of a mid-pack at the earliest, but a solid C. Looming Altasaur is up next. It's three and a white for a 1-7 creature dinosaur at common with absolutely no rules text whatsoever. Kind of annoys me that this doesn't have reach. Look at how tall it is. It has Altasaur as its name. Altitude. Why doesn't it block flyers? Anyways, I complained about people thinking an 04 was a great way to make it to the late game in previous blocks. No, a 1-7 is how you do that. Costing 4 mana hurts, for sure, but I'm not sure how cheap you can make a 1-7 and not just have it be overwhelming. If this was a 1-drop, you would have people playing 4 or 5 or 6 of these in draft if they could and just shutting the game down. Anyways, you absolutely do not play this regularly. This only goes in your deck if you do have a, a very late game plan, at which point it becomes kind of like a C. But in any decks that are trying to be a little bit fast, this should really just sit in your sideboard as much more of a D plus card. You bring it in if you discover that you're not actually the beat down when you thought you were. But I wouldn't just main deck this all willy nilly. But if I got a plan, I definitely want to play this. Maverin Fane, Dusk Apostle, is up next. Maverin is two and a white for a legendary creature vampire cleric at rare. He's a 2-2, and whenever one or more non-token vampires you control attack, create a 1-1 white vampire creature token with lifelink. This seems very solid and a great start to a go-wide build around. A 2-2 for 3 that makes a 1-1 lifelink each time it attacks is great because he's a vampire. Assuming you have a number of other vampires in your deck, this will potentially just go off the rails, especially if you mix in any sort of evasion to help get those attacks through. It's a little bit squishy at a 2-2, but I'd still first pick this and build around it every time. I've got Mavern at a B+. Up next is Paladin of the Bloodstained. Paladin of the Bloodstained is three and a white for a creature vampire knight at common. It's a 3-2, and when Paladin of the Bloodstained enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one white vampire creature token with lifelink. A 4-3 for 4 with 1-1 one, one of it being lifelink is fine. It's a very C card. C plus if you're pushing the vampire theme hard. Very mid-pack pick that you're just not going to go out of your way to get unless you have a real reason. Uh, not too much else to say about this. It's just fine. If you've got a spot, play it. And if you don't, don't. And if you really want vampires, this gets a little bit better because of course you get two vampires for the cost of one. Solid C. Up next is Pious Interdiction. Pious Interdiction is three and a white for an enchantment aura at common enchant creature. When Pious Interdiction enters the battlefield, you gain two life. Enchanted creature can't attack or block. It's pacifism. It's our pacifism of the set, and it's 100% playable. Every single copy of it that you can get your hands on. Sure, it's not two mana like we like to see our pacifisms, but four mana is still totally playable. It's not a snap first pick, but it's still pretty darn high. I'll take it as mid-pack uh, starts to roll around and probably even higher than that sometimes in the first few picks for sure. The two life gain is cool, but it's just not a reason to change the grade at all. It's just a solid, solid B, maybe even B plus. Although there are a lot of mana sinks in this set, so let's, let's keep it at a B. Priest of the Wakening Sun is up next. Priest of the Wakening Sun is a single white mana for a creature human cleric at rare. It's another 1-1 one, one for 1. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may reveal a dinosaur card from your hand. If you do, you gain 2 life. Pay 3 white white, sacrifice Priest of the Wakening Sun, search your library for a dinosaur card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. This somewhat hilariously reminds me of the Infernal Spawn of Evil from Unglued. You could reveal it once a turn in your hand and say, it's coming, and ping your opponent. I recommend you still say, it's coming, each time you reveal that dinosaur and gain two life. Not sure how good this actually is though, and frankly it feels like a really mediocre rare to me. A 1-1 one, one for 1 just isn't playable. It needs something amazing going on. If it gains you two life most turns, it becomes better for sure. Potentially having you at, I don't know, 10 life 
by turn five if you have a dinosaur every turn to show off then you can go and grab a bomb dinosaur after you i don't know chump block with this or something and i think that's the key i likely would only play this if i had a bomb game winning dinosaur in my deck if I'm just regular powered dinosaurs, I'm not sure this gives me enough value as an instant include, and it falls more to like a 22nd, 23rd card slot-ish. Nowhere near a high pick. Basically, I need a large number of dinosaurs to in basically ensure that I'm gaining two life every single turn, and even there, that's not a huge deal, or I need one of the game-ending bomb dinosaurs, in which case then... I'd be pretty happy to play this. So I'm going to put this at a C plus for now. Uh, but don't just throw this in your deck. It's not great in many cases. Up next is Pterodon Knight. Pterodon Knight is three and a white for a creature human knight at common. She's a three, three. And Pterodon Knight has flying as long as you control a dinosaur, which is kind of a flavor fail if your dinosaur is a brontosaurus or something. Anyways, it's a three, three for four, which is total C minus territory. You'll cut it whenever you can. Uh, if you have a ton of dinosaurs, it becomes a less good version of the Imperial Aerosaur that we just saw. Uh, just a vanilla 3-3 three, three flyer. It's a plain old C for me that, I don't know, it maybe pushes up to a C plus if you're packing a half dozen or more dinosaurs. But really, I think this is just a C. Play it if you can. Don't if you can't. Queen's Commission is up next. Queen's Commission is two and a white for a sorcery at common. Create two 1-1 one, one white vampire creature tokens with lifelink. Uh, if you're pushing the vampires, then this is kind of around a C plus. And if you're not, it's a 2-2 two, two for three with lifelink in a set where we get that for two mana at common. More of a C minus if you're not abusing the amount of vampires that you uh, that you want. As we'll see in the black set review, though, having a lot of vampires can be really good for a few cards. So uh, even for uh, Mavern, it can be very good, as we saw just a few cards ago. So if you're abusing vampires, kind of a C plus, And if you're not, kind of a C minus. Up next, we have Rallying Roar. Rallying Roar is two and a white for an instant at uncommon. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn untap them. A fun little trick, the surprise untap and the little bit of a pump can definitely lead to blowouts. Alternatively, it can be used as a weak trumpet blast to maybe end the game. All in all, it's a fine trick that if I'm going wide, I'll always play and if I'm not, I'm or I'm not planning on being aggressive, then I'll probably cut. It's really just a kind of middle of the road sort of trumpet blast effect. So a C. Raptor Companion is up next. It's one and a white for a creature dinosaur at common. It's a 3-1 and all it has is flavor text. It's uh, it's your prototypical 3-1 for 2 in white, which I love. I can't not love it. Plus, it's a very relevant creature type that may net you even more value. Always playable for me. I'm probably going to be overrating it a little bit at a C+. Plus. It's realistically more like a C, but I love 3-1s for 2 in white. So, C+. Plus. Up next is Ritual of Rejuvenation. Ritual of Rejuvenation is two and a white for an instant at common. You gain four life. Draw a card. Uh, absolutely not. Yes, the white-black vampire deck wants life to spend it in various ways, but there's just more than enough ways to get that, that you don't need to be spending a card slot in your deck and three mana. Yes, it replaces itself. No, I don't care. It's an F. It's unplayable. Don't play this card, please. Sanguine Sacrament is up next. Sanguine Sacrament is X white white for an instant at rare. You gain twice X life. Put Sanguine Sacrament on the bottom of its owner's library, which virtually would be the graveyard. You're not going to see the bottom of your library in 99% of games. So we're paying three mana to gain two life. Or if we're looking at the late game, we're paying, I don't know, maybe we have eight mana to gain 12 life. Absolutely not. I was unwilling to pay three mana to gain potentially upwards of 20 life with Oketra's Last Mercy. I'm not going to be playing this card ever. This is, this is just not, not playable. You don't play cards that just gain you life. I wouldn't play this if it just said I always gain 20 life. It's just not worth a card slot in your deck. Uh, solid F, unplayable. Uh, unfortunately, another rare that you're just not going to be happy to see in the pack. Up next is Settle the Wreckage. Settle the Wreckage is two white white for an instant at rare. Exile all attacking creatures target player controls. That player may search his or her library for that many basic land cards, put those cards onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle his or her library. 
This seems pretty great. It's an expensive, conditional path to exile for one creature, which is probably just totally fine. But the discount on this at two creatures or higher is gigantic. I would play this as a four mana conditional path of egg, path to exile for one creature. Being able to hit all the attacking creatures is just fantastic. You will make it a little bit more likely that your opponent's going to draw gas instead of lands. And yes, you're ramping them. But if you exile some fantastic attackers, who cares? I'll probably first pick this every time. And it sits just slightly below grade due to the only attacking condition. I'm going to give it a B plus. I think Settle the Wreckage looks very, very, very solid as a, a bit of removal. And... I don't think you would ever do this, but in a really weird circumstance, you could attack with some creatures, exile them yourself to ramp yourself, but that's probably never going to happen. So B plus for Settle the Wreckage. Sheltering Light is up next. Sheltering Light is a single white mana for an instant on, at on common. Target creature gains indestructible until end of turn. Scry, one. Uh, eh. Not getting a power boost or death touch or something usually makes an indestructible trick just way too narrow to be worthwhile. Getting scry one attached to it is nice, but it really doesn't raise this above the C minus grade for me. I'm going to try my best not to play this. It's a pretty weak combat trick, so C minus. Shining Aerosaur is up next. Shining Aerosaur is four and a white for a creature dinosaur at common. It's a three, four, and it flies. And that's the end of the story for that. A three, four flyer for five is a little bit under rate to what we're uh, kind of happy with. I'd probably cut this in general unless A, I needed more dinosaurs. B, I really missed out on having a way to finish the game and this is the best that I can get. Or C, it's sealed, where it's probably going to be a heck of a lot slower than draft. And even draft is looking like it might be slow. Otherwise, this is sitting at a C- and something that you should just generally cut if possible. Skyblade of the Legion is up next. Skyblade of the Legion is a 1 and a white creature vampire soldier at common for a 1-3. And all it does is fly as well. Uh, another French vanilla flyer. A 1-3 flyer for 2 is something that we've seen a bunch before, and it's always just kind of... Eh. It's a very 23rd card and almost functions better as a sideboard against two power flyers. I'll avoid playing this unless I need some more vampires, in which case it gets a higher grade than the C- minus that I'm going to give it for now. And even if you are playing a bunch of vampires, this goes up to like, I don't know, a C, C plus at the absolute max. Just not a fantastic card. Up next is Slash of Talons. Slash of Talons is a single white mana for an instant at common. Slash of Talons deals two damage to target attacking or blocking creature. Two damage really isn't much, especially in a set where there's a whole lot of toughness. There are a bunch of one X1s and X2s, but there's one sevens and etc. Uh, making shock conditional to attacking or blocking hurts it quite a bit as well. And ultimately, this won't be removal so much as it will be a combat trick that reads... Give target creature you control in combat plus two plus zero, which isn't exactly great. Bottom tier removal, mild combat trick. I'll play it if I need a playable. Otherwise, I'm going to cut it. I've got this at a C. Steadfast Armasaur is up next. Steadfast Armasaur is three and a white for a creature dinosaur at on common. It's a two three with vigilance and you can pay one and a white and tap it. And Steadfast Armasaur deals damage equal to its toughness to target creature blocking or blocked by it. It's a Stegosaurus, so it's, you know, spinning around and smacking them with the tail before it bites them with its weird beak mouth thing. Uh, there's a mild toughness theme with an assault formation creature that we'll see next week. Making this block as a 5 3 or, or, or attack and get blocked as a 5 3 is quite nice and it will make your opponents think twice about attacking into it or blocking it. Not super sold on paying four. Four mana for it, especially if your opponent just decides to not block and take two instead of blocking it and having their creature take five. So I think I'm playing this generally in more defensive decks and definitely being happy about it there. Definitely being happy playing this card. There will be some matches where this just holds the ground way better than it should and then some matches where it just doesn't. All in all, I'm at a C plus on this. Uh, higher if you really do plan on being defensive. Uh, it might actually come down as being a B minus in the end. L let's be optimistic. Let's start this at a B minus. 
Sunrise Seeker is up next. It's four and a white for a creature human scout. And boy, did it take me a long time to actually figure out where the heck the human is in this art. But they're sitting on the neck of a, a large brontosaurus. They're a little tiny guy. He's got his hand up, kind of covering his eyes from the sun. Anyway, Sunrise Seeker is four and a white for a creature human scout. A common, it's a 3-3 three, three with vigilance. When Sunrise Seeker enters the battlefield, it explores. A 3-3 Vigilance that draws a land, or a 4-4 Vigilance that scries for 5 mana is really overcosted in any of those configurations in my mind, basically any way you look at it. It's just not impactful impactful enough for me to want to actually play this regularly. Falls into a C plus, or sorry, not a C plus, a C minus for me. I'm going to cut it more than I play it kind of range. At 5 mana, I just need to be doing something more than anything that this does for me. So C minus for Sunrise Seeker. Territorial Hammer Skull is up next. Territorial Hammer Skull is two and a white for a creature dinosaur at common. It's a 2-3, and whenever Territorial Hammer Skull attacks, tap target creature on opponent controls. A 2-3 three for three isn't great. It's not a card that I'm super looking forward to play. I prefer three twos for three, but tapping each time it attacks is very, very, very solid. These in an aggressive deck, especially stacked, will just cause absolute nightmares. These only fall off if you're just not planning on attacking that much. Much. All in all, this is a C plus, and I'll probably play every single one of these that I can. Uh, I don't think it quite pushes up to a B minus. It would if it was a 3-2, but as a 2-3, I'm going to keep it at a C plus. Tokatli Honor Guard is up next. Tokatli Honor Guard is one and a white for a creature human soldier at rare. She's a 1-3, and creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. This seems much more constructed as well. Constructed only, I would even say. It's a 1-3 for 2, which is pretty mediocre, and a symmetrical effect like this in Limited will potentially hurt you more than it hurts your opponent. Just not worth playing. Maybe sideboarding in if you see some terrible ETB triggers and you don't mind losing your own. If she had Flash, she might be a little bit better in Limited, but as is, I'm going to go on a D-. minus. I don't think you ever main deck her, and you rarely bring her in. Our second last card is Vampire's Zeal. Vampire's Zeal is a single white mana for an instant at common. Target creature gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. If it's a vampire, it gains first strike until end of turn. Two thirds of a giant strength is okay, but it's really only a C at best. Play it if you have a slot and you'd rather be playing decent creatures or removal over it, but if you've got a slot, you've got a slot. If you're in Vampires, this is likely removal in combat, but it's still bottom tier at that. It's a C all around, Vampires or not. Our final card for today is a mythic. We're going to we're going to shut this down with a, a big card here, Awakening Sun's Avatar. Awakening Sun's Avatar is 5 white white white. For a creature dinosaur avatar at Mythic, it's a 7-7, seven, seven. and when Awakening Sun's Avatar enters the battlefield, if you cast it from your hand, destroy all non-dinosaur creatures. Uh, a 7-7 seven, seven left behind after Wrathing is very, very serious business. Five white, white, white is an extremely serious casting cost. You're going to need to be very heavily in white and also somehow be ramping or extremely controlling. Uh, probably you want this to be in a white green or maybe a full on Naya deck where you'll have maybe even some more dinosaurs left over and hopefully your opponent doesn't have that many dinosaurs. If you cast this, you generally should be winning the game. But I think the question is going to be how reliably do you actually get to cast this? The format is going to need to be insanely slow for this to be reliable. Even in the slowest sets we've ever seen, this is still a card that would ask a lot in any of those previous sets. I'm going to start this at a B plus, assuming, of course, that you build specifically around it, that you are going to get to eight mana. But you need to know when to cut this because that's going to be somewhat frequently, I think. So a B plus, but a very uh, cautious, be careful with this B plus. So that's going to wrap it up for white today. Uh, this set looks amazing. I can't wait to get to the rest of the set reviews with you guys. Uh, there's mana sinks. There's high toughnesses. It looks like you can block and not just get punished for it. This set looks 
fantastic. White looks really cool. The dinosaur synergies are really cool. The vampire synergies, which we'll see in a couple of days with the black half, look really cool. And I feel like I'm really going to enjoy drafting vampires. Uh, yeah, all in all, I'm excited about this. Let me know what cards you're excited about. Let me know your evaluations of cards. Do you disagree with me about evaluations of cards? As I said, talk with me, talk amongst yourselves down below, etc. As always, if you do have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me on Twitter at the Manaleek. That's L-E-E-K, like the vegetable, not the card. You can also find me at facebook.com slash semanaleek, twitch.tv slash semanaleek, and patreon.com slash semanaleek. If you want to become a backer there, work your way towards earning a manaleek playmat, etc. If you like the content, click that thumbs up button. If you haven't already, if you're brand new, hi, welcome. Click subscribe if you want to see more, see when the uh, rest of the videos go up. I do set reviews and all kinds of draft videos and crack packs and top 10 lists and uh, real life draft recaps and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So click subscribe if you want to see more. If you do have any questions, comments, or suggestions, though, let me know. Otherwise, see you all tomorrow for the blue set review.